good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our City Council Governance Committee meeting. The time is now, what does that say, 11.39? 11.40. 30. Let's say 11.40. 11.40. 11.39. Okay. All right. Um, we'll go ahead and pick it off. Uh, City Clerk? Yes, sir. Mayor Barringer? Here. Council Member Servino? Here. Council Member Viacon? Mm -hmm. She's here. Council Member Saldana? Here. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. And Councilwoman Sunderbell? Here. Mayor, we do have a forum. All right. Well, welcome everyone. We have uh, several items on our agenda in a longer time period to get through them, so we'll start in order. Uh, we'll start with the approval of the meeting minutes from our governance meeting of October 23rd. So moved. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second for approval of the City Council Governance Committee meeting minutes of October 23rd. Any questions, clarifications? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number two. Item number two. Item number two is a briefing of possible action regarding the development of evaluations and compensation <coughs> review of executives appointed by the mayor and city council. Mayor Council, uh, I'm here on, on representing on behalf of the mayor's office and on your behalf uh, with respect to the performance review for the council appointed executives. Uh, about a year ago, uh, in the mayor's office, we found ourselves in a situation where we were looking at the need to provide performance reviews for the city manager, city clerk, and city auditor. Uh, the uh, last year we had no specified process or performance metrics for any of these positions last year so we through the mayor's office coordinated the review and we we're responsible for the review process for, for 2018. You'll also recall that in the process last year of, of looking at per, uh, performance metrics and performance evaluations for these executives that the council adopted uh, well, uh, for, for, finalize, I should say, performance review met, uh, metrics and standards for the city manager, the city auditor, and the city clerk. This is, that there's a packet that the city clerk is, can hand out here that actually this may be a reminder of what that was discussed with respect to, to those standards for this calendar year. Um, you also recall that Following that process, the council elected to hire consultants specifically through a process. They hired Siegel Waters Consultant to create a consultant managed performance review process and also look at the appropriate compensation levels for not only the city manager, city clerk, and auditor, but also added the presiding judge of the municipal court to that process. The purpose of our presentation today is to update you on what, what will ultimately be the conclusion of the 2018 performance review process and then also Linda Wisher is here with Siegel Waters to provide you an update on with, with regards to her process. So with regards to performance review for this year, uh, we will uh, we're, we'll be asking that the staff, uh, the, the, the clerk, the auditor, and the city manager provide the city council a self-evaluation of their performance against their performance metrics by November the 21st. The mayor will ask the chairman of the audit committee of the audit committee to uh, consult, have a special meeting by which the city auditor will be reviewed and they will make recommendations. We're asking that the municipal court advisory committee review the presiding judge and that we're recommending that the governance committee review the city clerk's performance and uh, that all of your respective committee uh, recommendations be forwarded to the entire city council for consideration and review. The city manager would be reviewed by the entire city council. In terms of a timeline, we're proposing that those committee meetings occur for the for those for the various positions between December the 3rd and December the 11th, and that there are opportunities in executive session for review and discussion as permitted, um, and that there, if there was formal action with respect to compensation or, or performance review that that would occur at meetings either in late December or January. So at this point I'm going to conclude my presentation and before I do I was wondering if you have any particular questions before I hand it over to our consultant. Councilman Sandoval. 
Thank you, Trey, for your presentation for your work on this. Um, this is formal action on compensation as the last bullet. Uh, that means we would be taking a council action in a vote. Yeah, that, that's what's contemplated there, and that could be for any of the particular executives. <laughs> Let me introduce Linda Wishart from Seagulls Water. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, just briefly update you on where we're at in the performance review and, and compensation uh, survey process. Am I going backwards? Trey, Trey already um, indicated the uh, the purpose uh, of, hire, of engaging Seagull Waters was to take a look at performance evaluations for the four council appointed executives, city manager, city clerk, city auditor, and the presiding judge of the municipal court. As part of that, we began the process <laughs> with uh, extensive one-on-one -on -one interviews of the mayor, uh, and all the council members, as well as the four incumbents in the positions um, that we're researching. We provided a summary report, and uh, it was basically sort of an overview of the uh, basics of performance management and the types of uh, circumstances that would be beneficial for the city to be looking at when it when it looks at metrics and um, performance of those four individuals. We will be preparing what, uh, we're gonna go over some of the objectives uh, or observations that uh, were brought forward after those interviews that uh, I spoke about initially. But part of that process, it indicated that there was a need for job summaries or job descriptions for those four positions. So we will be providing a draft of those by the 19th of November. Uh, our compensation survey was uh, developed. It was a customized survey with regards to the four positions. And we identified what we call benchmark organizations or those peers um, that it was appropriate to compare the city of San Antonio to. And Within that context, the survey went out to those peers on November the 2nd with a request for their participation and response by November the 14th. Again, there are eight critical factors uh, for ensuring effective performance evaluations. I, I'm not going to necessarily read through each one of these. I, I understand each of you have a copy on your laptop as well as perhaps a hard copy. But um, again, I think these are the four eight critical areas that, that should be addressed in a performance evaluation process. And these are the things that were highlighted in um, stakeholder interviews. So uh, these are basically the top observation uh, based on those stakeholder interviews. And I think it was fairly, um, it was very interesting to me in that it was fairly consistent with regards to kinds of questions and issues that were raised. Um, so going through some of those observations, obviously there was a desire to have a more structured process, um, more structured timeline with regards to um, the, the fiscal year performance rather than the calendar year. Again, I mentioned no job summaries for those positions existed. There was a lack of consistency and clarity of the expectations of various uh, council members with regards to these positions and their performance. And they were looking for consistent consensus on the behaviors and values that should be demonstrated by the executives. Again, there was a desire for a well-defined um, goals and metrics, if you will, uh, regarding those main goals and expectations uh, aligned with what we call behavioral indicators, which provides an opportunity for everyone who is performing the evaluation as an evaluator 
to have a more consistent identification of what those indicators look like when performance is successful. One of the things that was also brought forth is that perhaps we needed a greater emphasis on customer service, customer focus. And so certainly not only external measurements of customer service, but internal as well. And of course, incorporation and focus on the um, city, city's core, core values. In addition, there were uh, questions regarding uh, consistency with regards to the performance ratings themselves and um, the rating scale, as well as how various uh, criteria should be weighted for the overall performance evaluation. Um, again, back to the uh, uh, structured, formalized process, there's a desire for uh, a greater process in the self-evaluation process as well as the evaluation um, prepared by the council. And so the, one of the observations was there was a desire for more feedback from direct reports to those four positions, um, not only internally uh, with regards to staff, but externally as well. There was a, a concern that it was not clear and needed to be identified what the link between compensation and performance should be and requires clarification uh, of the roles and responsibilities to the uh, council and board committees regarding <coughs> various performance feedback. Uh, one of the issues that arose is currently we're um, using uh, um, let's see, I'm sorry. Currently, we're on a, a calendar year performance basis, and, and certainly one of the things that was raised is whether or not it should be on a fiscal year basis. As I mentioned before, the compensation survey has been um, sent to the various peers. I'll give you a quick rundown uh, of the peer comparators that have been identified. Uh, we are using 10, City of Austin, the City of Dallas, City of El Paso, uh, City of Fort Worth, City of Houston, City of Phoenix, City of Charlotte, North Carolina, City of San Jose, California, City of Oklahoma City, and City of Virginia Beach, Virginia. Those are the main uh, city or municipality comparators um, in addition, supplemental data is being gathered from various uh, private sector entities in the area, such as SAWS, CPS, the University Health System, uh, the Alamo Community College, Bear County, uh, and etc. Uh, a few, a few others in the area. So, all of those are part of the compensation survey. Uh, our plan is to have the analysis prepared and provided. Uh, by December the 7th for review and discussion with a final compensation report with recommendations um, by January the 7th. Just very briefly on transition, this sort of is a transition year in that um, we want to utilize the goals and performance measures that were already developed. Uh, during during the uh, goal setting process in the spring and we want to incorporate uh, a new rating scale with regards to four levels of rating needs improvement fully successful uh, commendable and um, outstanding the recommendation is to include not only the four core values that are so important throughout the organization but certainly to identify core and specific competencies required of incumbents in these four positions. You will note that the four core values are mentioned. Some of the competen competencies that are recommended include uh, leadership and developing others, service excellence, and strategic planning and organization.
as I indicated earlier, uh, weighting the various uh, criteria within the performance evaluation. Um, we have recommended 25 to 20% be weighted on the core competencies and core values with 25% on what we call specific competencies, competencies, and those will be specific to the job. And finally, 55% um, overall to the objectives and goals for the year. That's a very quick run through. Does anyone have any questions? All right, <laughs> thank you, Linda, for the presentation. Just to rewind here for a minute. Um, you know, just as the city staff is devoted, so is city council to process improvement, continuous improvement. Um, it's been relayed over the last several years, a couple of years, um, certainly this past year, that we wanted a more standardized and uh, predictable flow for performance evaluations as it relates to the four appointed um, city council appointed executives, the city manager, the city clerk, the city auditor, and a presiding uh, municipal court judge. Um, so that's where we are today. Uh, this is an update on the process. Um, I just have one question. Um, going to your previous slide, the, the proposed weighting, and even the slide, two slides before that, with regard to the proposed evaluation rating scale, where is that from? Is that just your recommendation, or is that based on peer review? And it, it, it's it's based on industry practice and single water's recommendations. Okay. I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into um, the the recommendation on those specific things uh, and the rationale for that as we as we move through the rest of this process. But sure. um, I'll move now to um, Councilman Deere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have a question because we kept it kept saying over and over to establish the review for um, fiscal year and not the calendar year. But the contracts run through the calendar year. Is that correct? Sorry, anybody? That contracts are running through the calendar year. We, we have only one employer that's under contract, and it, right. And, right, it is okay. on the calendar year. So one of the things that I want to make sure that we, uh, when looking at this and reviewing it, and when the self evaluation happens, um, that or the self appraisal happens, that it is going to be consistent with just the year, the work of the body of work with the year, correct? For the self appraisals. Okay. That's correct. Okay. So that all of that will be communicated to our to the four appointees. Okay. Um, and can you uh, talk a little bit more about how it will work for the more feedback from direct reports inside and outside of the organization? What does that look like? We're still working on the um, finalization of that part of the information, but it would be uh, surveys to identify direct reports for each position um, that basically respond to the core competencies and the core values of the organization <coughs> and how they interact with the, that position. Okay. All right. Well, I think this is a, a, a very much needed step, so thank you. Okay. Any other questions? And, and for the benefit of my colleagues, uh, you should also note that a very similar process is underway for CPS and for SAWS uh, and various uh, iterations of that. And the whole goal here is to make sure that uh, as we set compensation, we're doing so in a defensible way from one year to the next. So I uh, appreciate the work and we'll have a, an update on the next step uh, as we get to it. Um, what's that? We'll have As Linda mentioned, we're going to start to see some of the survey information come back, and then by December the 7th, there's going to be, there, they'll have a preliminary report back by December the 7th, so that could permit you in, as a council to hear more recommendations in either executive session or in a special meeting of some sort. Okay. And I'll be scheduling my meetings with council members uh, shortly after the holidays as well for as it relates to the 2018 calendar year. So, all right. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on now to item number three. Item number three is a briefing on a council consideration request by council member Bethel Trevino to bring forward amendments related to the MF-33 and MF-25 zoning districts as part of recently adopted comprehensive land use categories. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. A, and a handout is being provided to each of you outlining the council consideration request on the agenda, along with the staff recommendation. Uh, this handout basically summarizes the memo that's in the system for this particular item. So once you get the hand light on, on the handout on page two, you'll notice on the right, the land use categories adopted by City Council on October 11th. The council consideration request submitted by Councilman Trevino is to remove the MF33 district from the medium density residential category and add MF25 to the neighborhood mixed use category. I've circled those two land use categories in green on that particular page. After the CCR was submitted, the mayor's office convened districts one and seven, as well as the planning staff in order to better understand the issues related to the request. During the discussions, there were three issues raised, and I've highlighted those on page three of the handout. The potential height of new developments, compatibility, and the future designation of small lots. First, potential height of new developments. There are currently small clusters of parcels zoned MF33 in a number of areas near and around downtown, due primarily, of course, to zoning code convergence. There are concerns with these parcels Currently zoned MF33 can allow developments where the height and scale would be out of context with the surrounding area. Second, compatibility. On very early draft land use maps, some areas in the downtown and west side sub-area plans are shown with the medium density residential land use category. There has been some concern expressed that allowing up to MF33 densities and height would be out of context with the surrounding areas. Also, some of these neighborhoods include areas with blocks of what we call MF, M, MF4 zoning, which, if categorized as medium density residential, may allow for increased density if they were to be rezoned. Uh, if you recall, the RM4 zoning district was removed from the urban low density <coughs> residential category, given concerns raised as to how it was being applied. And finally, as it relates to the future designation of small lots, there are a number of parcels that would likely be rezoned to the R1 and R2 zoning district if those are adopted by council. Those are also currently shown as medium density residential on some very early draft maps. And the concern here is that expressed in aggregate, the densities of these smaller parcel parcels would range from 21 units to about 35 units per acre. Uh, thus indicating the need to rezone them to a higher density as allowed in the medium density residential land use category. And regarding the separate request to add the MF25 zoning district to neighborhood, medium, neighborhood mixed use land use category, it was noted that having the current maximum of MF18 limits the ability for greater density and transit supported land use along key neighborhood corridors. So page four of the handout shows a staff's recommendation in response to each request. Staff recommends not removing the MF33 zoning district from the medium density residential land use category. However, we are proposing uh, several alternative solutions that were facilitated in the discussions with the mayor's office to address the issues raised. In regards to the potential height of the new developments, two possible approaches would be rezoning those parcels, and then also reviewing the ordinance we currently have in place, addressing the application of height allowances to ensure that their intent and application is uniform. We will continue to work with our SA Tamar sub area planning team members on the most appropriate patterns and locations for the various land use categories in each of the sub area plans. The draft land use maps that, we, that we've had to date have not been taken out to the public community, um, but will be after the work has been completed in those areas. Staff recommends moving forward with a process to add MF25 zoning to the neighborhood mixed use land use category. The process should allow for public review and comment, including review by the Planning Commission's TAC, the Planning Commission, the Zoning Commission, before consideration approval by City Council. This completes my briefing, Mayor, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. 
Thank you, Bridget. Uh, Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, uh, I want to thank you and your office um, for helping to continue the conversation on, on, on something that is affecting our entire city, uh, but specifically what we're seeing in the inner city. Uh, so I also want to thank you, Bridget, your staff, for, for working with us uh, to help address uh, the concerns that have been brought up by, by these neighborhoods. And I think, first and foremost, we must acknowledge the fact that these neighborhoods have pointed out quite clearly that there's incompatible development happening. Um, and they also want to just simply feel like we're listening to some of these issues. And there is, of course, never going to be a silver bullet, but I think that there is a path forward here. And uh, so, again, I want to thank uh, staff and the mayor's office, uh, Councilman Sandoval, that we convened uh, in, at my field office. And I want to thank all the neighborhoods that have come together to offer their their input, their support. Uh, I want to again reaffirm that you are being heard. Um, it's really, truly a part of uh, an issue where we find ourselves many times with with development and, and design. Uh, sometimes we're we're caught up in this idea that there's only one option available, one solution, and we've shown here that there is more available to us, and that's the way we should be growing our city, to truly find and capitalize on good ideas, ideas that are done collaboratively uh, to, to help move uh, our inner city communities in a way that they feel <clears throat> they know that their, their issues are being addressed, while also looking at the, the overall concerns of the entire city. So I also want to acknowledge all the letters that have come in. Uh, we certainly appreciate the concerns uh, being addressed and, and can agree that, that I think we found a balanced approach to, to moving us forward. Um, again, uh, <clears throat> these neighborhoods are, are really truly in need of, of this kind of attention. And uh, you know, by allowing the R1, R2 uh, code to be created, it, it's really given us another option. And I think that that is uh, something that we, sh we should all build on uh, on top of the fact that again mayor i want to again point out that uh, we've talked about committing to uh, pushing the large area rezonings uh, much faster in this process because what we know is that uh, what we call them rezone is that we they're really corrective zones and uh, as bridget pointed out there's been some translation errors in the past you have uh, you know, parts of the city that that have existed for, for a long, long time and have had to go through many iterations of, of <clears throat> zoning uh, designations and, and translation errors. And I think that's why we have arrived to some of the, the issues that, or points that we've, we've gotten to today. And I think that these are the steps that help us to address that, to, to work together on that. And uh, I, I certainly support this. And are we needing a motion to move these recommendations forward? To full council? Okay, well, so um, <clears throat> again, I just want to say thank you again, Bridget. Um, with that, I, I motion to, uh, to. I'm sorry, if I may, it, I hate to interrupt, um, but in terms of the motions, we'd, we'd be looking at moving forward the MF25 and adding that, so we'd have to go through a process to get back to full council for that. So, but you, you need action to. Yes, I need to action to for that to process. Be so, yes, sir. Yeah. I would say. Um, uh, a, a motion. Uh, I would entertain a motion to advance these recommendations to the next steps in the process. Yes. Okay. So we have a motion to to move this through the next steps of the process. Right. right. Thank you. Did, was there a second? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, discussion. Councilman Sandoval. No. Okay. Councilman Trevino. Uh, Councilman Salani. Thanks, Mayor. I, I just want to make sure that I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm filtering through the, the emails that I'm getting. I'm looking at the backup uh, letters of, I don't know if there's support or, <coughs> or maybe Councilman Trevino is on the way Monte Vista, Tobin Hill, Beacon Hill, uh, King William. Without reading the whole thing, the Cliff Notes version is they, they support this or they don't support this? Uh, they support this. And so, again, I, and maybe I was a little too brief in my, in my, my thanks. Uh, I want to thank, uh, uh, I've been thanking everybody, but I specifically want to thank the, the neighbors that have come together on this. And uh, Chrissy from my staff has done an outstanding job uh, working with council staff to make sure that uh, 
the voices are being heard. I want to thank uh, specifically all the neighborhoods that we've been in touch with in and out of District 1. I mean, there's, this isn't just a District 1 issue. Uh, yeah, there was some concerns that we were having to, to carve something out because we didn't have an option. But now that we have the R1, R2, that gives us more options. And that's what I was referring to, uh, making sure that, that we have more options available to us. We don't simply have to be forced to, to uh, carve out something because we don't have any other uh, direction to go. So I guess it's my understanding that we have their full support. Okay, and then they see this, they understand the implications, the consequences, the benefits, and, and I'll very first to the next. Well, I think we're all we're all ready to move forward on this. Uh, the, the the point I, I would make is that there's more work to do. That, that this is simply one layer to uh, a, a multi-layered strategy to to address a lot of these concerns. So this is one of those steps. And and Bridget to the staff, how are you all feeling about the next step going forward on this? This is y'all's recommendation as well. Yes. So we do support moving forward with adding MF25. However, we don't support removing MF33. But as we um, outlined in the on page four, there are a number of other solutions that we can work towards um, achieving the goal as outlined in the CCR. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Saldana. Anybody else? Um, so. I want to acknowledge that uh, Councilman Pedro. So, um, where, what is the, tell me about the next process. Are you going to go out into the neighborhoods and the communities again? So in terms of adding MF25 to neighborhood mixed use, yes, we go through a process that allows for public input. So we have to go through, back to the Planning Commission TAC, the Planning Commission. So what about R1 and R2s? The R1, R2 is a process that's going through the council process now. I believe okay. it's back to city council on Thursday. So if those districts were to be approved by council on Thursday, we would look at how um, they would fall into a particular land use category. So that step is more or less dependent upon council action on Thursday. We're just pointing out that there are options and solutions if that were to move forward. Those are actually two different processes because right. my process already down Thank you, Councilman Leogran, and, and I want to acknowledge our Tier 1 associations, our neighborhoods that are here, I see some day here as well as Coastal McColgan, uh, and also the, the difficult work that the staff of our offices had. I feel badly for you, Councilman Trevino, but it seems like every single one of these issues has been challenging and difficult uh, that you've taken the leadership on, so I appreciate that work. Um, First rule in public policy making is do no harm. Um, the intent of the original uh, proposal would have addressed uh, the neighborhood concerns. Unfortunately, it wasn't going to um, leave other areas of town without impacts. And so we've been working very hard, and Councilman Trevino, I think, has found uh, a great solution uh, to ensure that not only are the neighborhoods that are experiencing the incompatible development taken care of moving forward, but we also have the ability to prevent those negative impacts from happening in other parts of the city. So it's going to require some cooperation uh, because there are multiple moving parts to this solution. Um, so Bridget, you have to let us know when things are getting off track with the rest of this, including the large area rezones um, and the R1, R2 process. So please uh, keep us surprised at that, but we want to move this forward so everybody, I think, ultimately gets what they're looking for. So um, thank you again for all the hard work. And um, we'll now thank Councilman, Councilwoman Sandoval. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for taking the lead on this, uh, Councilman. Um, and thank you, Bridget, your team, and Rudy, for uh, working with, with the neighborhoods. Um, I just wanted to, to know, as we move forward on this, what's the plan for keeping the, uh, the neighborhoods and our council members apprised of the progress? In terms of adding MF25, there is a process that we have to go through. So we would go through getting public input on adding that particular zoning category or zoning district to that to uh, that particular land use category. So that's one process. In terms of the other steps or solutions outlined, as we're going through our sub area planning process, we are engaging planning team members, the community. We have a number of meetings left that we still have to have for the 
um, the sub area plans that we're currently working on. So that involves some level of engagement and uh, based upon the CCR and the public participation process that you've outlined, really ramping up what we do in terms of that particular process. If R1, R2 is adopted by council on Thursday, we would look at which land use category, category it would fall into. So of course that would mean notifying neighborhoods, associations, um, getting out to the community, let them know that this particular zoning district has been adopted and where we'll, where it would go and, and which land use category it would go. And of course we work with development services so that as cases come in, everyone would be aware of where it is and where it falls. So, so my question is more about how you would work with the council offices and keep them apprised as this goes forward. We actually have monthly meetings with the council offices throughout, throughout the SHMR process. So we update all the council staff on where we are with the process, um, what decisions are being made, and briefing them also on individual uh, plans and the process of the plan. So for example, with the land use process that we just went through, we met with the council offices to let them know this is what's going on. And so we have monthly meetings with, with your staff. Okay. And I'd be happy to brief council members too. No, no, as long as the staff has access to, to you and is able to get an update on what's going on. Yes. Um, we do have monthly meetings, I believe the third Friday of our month. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, thank you, Councilman Sandoval. There is a motion and a second for approval of the staff recommendations on item number three. Yes, sir. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number four. Item number four is consideration of at-large appointments to the Planning Commission. And Mayor and Council, there are six slots to fill. Uh, we received over 50 applications total. Uh, you made up the committee that vetted through all of those. And the committee came up with 12 recommendations for interviews. Of those 12, we have approximately 10 here today that will be interviewed. Six of the slots that are going to be filled um, is what the total is. One of those will only have a term that expires October 2019 because of Casey Whittington's uh, resignation, while all the other five, uh, those terms will expire in 2020. These are two-year terms, and as you know, the entire board is comprised of nine members for two-year terms. Of course, they meet monthly at the Development Services Office on the second and fourth Wednesdays at 2 p.m. So with your permission, Mayor, we can go ahead and begin the interviews. Okay, great, thank you, um, Madam Clerk. All right, so the way we'll do this is we'll have uh, in alphabetical order uh, each of our candidates come forward. Uh, I think if we can uh, have folks wait in the outside as they're called in um, to give everybody a fair chance. Uh, so would all, the would all the applicants at this time follow Brandon Smith? And as you're called in, uh, you'll get your opportunity to be interviewed by the mayor and council. Thank you. Who's going to be first? The first person is Christopher Garcia. Okay. Is Mr. Garcia here? Christopher, you just walk down. Okay. Just walk down. Okay. Christopher, you're going to be first. You can check the, the podium, please. Be mindful of time here for a second. Mayor, we have a timer. Okay. All right. Chris, if you give us a, a two minute statement and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Is everybody saying more? Okay. And have we started the? Uh, yes. And yes. Okay. I'm currently serving on the planning commission as the vice chair, and I'm asking for your consideration and support to continue serving on the planning commission because I have a deep passion for San Antonio. As planning commissioners, we are charged with balancing the needs of a development or redevelopment and requirements of our master plan known as SA Tomorrow. Accomplishing this balance requires an understanding of the intent of the master plan, where our city has been, and where it is going, along with the associated mi micro and macro uh, effects of our commission's decisions. The growth of our city needs to be managed in a way that encourages responsible development that is in concert with SA Tomorrow, uh, the master plan, 
we citizens help create. We can't have the perks of a big city while maintaining our small, family-oriented um, style of life here in San Antonio. As a former HOA president and current board member, I always look to how development will affect the neighborhoods. It's why I always ask if there's any questions or concerns from communities at our meetings. Uh, we can't have the exciting developments we need and maintain our quality of life. Our board and commissions have been formed to handle variations to our codes, plans, and guidelines. I am completing, currently completing service on the Building Related and Fire Code Appeals and Advisory Board uh, and have also served in the past on the Zoning Board of Adjustments making those kinds of decisions. I have served when it came to update their associated codes and standards and I have that valuable experience. As for my personal background, uh, I'm a product of the Edgewood School District with parents and in-laws that still live in the area, so I get a feeling for what uh, some of the older neighborhood's concerns are. Uh, graduated with, from Trinity University with an engineering degree, spent about 10 years in the private sector, uh, doing work here in San Antonio and South Texas, even a few out-of-state projects. Um, if work didn't take me to different parts of the city, volunteering with different campaigns and causes did. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. All right, questions for Mr. Garcia? Councilman Sandoval? Well, why don't we just, we'll go around uh, for each candidate. Hey, Chris, thank you for your application. Uh, one of the processes that the city's working on is uh, the a comprehensive climate action and adaptation plan right now, and it will uh, eventually come to a uh, planning commission for, for review. I just want to know um, if you know anything about climate change or climate adaptation and uh, what you think your role as a planning commissioner might be. In, uh, in helping the city meet its climate goals. Yeah, so I was an engineer, trust, trust me, the science on, on climate change is what it is. Um, also on the, the other board that I'm on, the building related code, we just uh, mm -hmm. motioned to adopt the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code, which as you know is about energy conservation and buildings and stuff of that nature. Um, it's interesting because the state actually only adopts the energy, um, its codes and standards, I think it's every six years, but we decided to you know, go ahead and move ahead and adopt the 2018 code for energy conservation, even though we kind of, we could have left it alone, but we decided to keep it up to date. Uh, so our responsibility on the planning commission was to look at the, what the proposal is and see how is this going to affect our city and how can we, how is it going to affect the development, how is it going to affect how our city changes and uh, what did, how does it affect the other things that are in the purview of the planning commission, you know, like you have SA corridor, so that's transportation, so that leads to reduction in uh, emissions and stuff in that nature. Thank you. 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 Their neighborhood plan that they've worked on for years and years will go away. What has been your thoughts and positions on this currently sitting on the board? Yes, yeah, so um, that's definitely something that I've heard and I understand that. Um, honestly, some of those plans have been there for decades, and so I don't think there's anything wrong with reevaluating it. I mean, has the neighborhood changed? Uh, do they still want to implement those? If they do, that's fine. We'll just have a, I think we should implement them and kind of refresh them, if you will. And if they don't want to change how the master plan is, that's fine, we'll just put a current date on it. But if the neighborhood has changed, because like I said, some of it's from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, from the 90s or 80s or beyond that, if that's the case, then it would be a good opportunity to bring it up to date. Uh, maybe the goals have changed throughout the years. Maybe there's new residents that have come in there, maybe the uh, some of the things they thought they wanted, they, they started to happen and they decided we don't really want to do those things anymore. So I see it as a good opportunity to update the plans with uh, what's going on today in the city and those neighborhoods. Thank you, Councilman Villagran. So, Chris, my, my question is, we're, we're kind of in a transition period right now before SAMR was truly uh, fully implemented with all of the community plans and the um, regional plans and so forth. Uh, I'd like to get your perspective on, on that as you make decisions parcel by parcel uh, under the old um, way of doing things. 
where are the pressure points and how do you see uh, us best able to move forward on SA tomorrow? Um, basically the SA tomorrow process itself because you're, it's going through and like you said evaluating parcel by parcel to make recommendations to bring those land usage uh, categories up to date. We see a lot of cases where the zoning is matches what's going on but the land usage doesn't because sometime back in the day somebody just put a big paintbrush and there's stuff that doesn't match. So I think that really comes into it. Uh, yeah, I can understand the concern because you know parcel by parcel you can start changing things but that's why I always kind of look to see what's, what's around this. You know, obviously it doesn't make sense to put like a, an industrial usage in front of a single family home, right? Uh, but that's why I love to see what's going on around this neighborhood. Where is it located? What is the community? You know, when they show up and they vocalize their support or if they're not in favor of something, uh, what are they saying? What are their concerns? Sometimes we will make motions for continuance because you can tell that, you know what, they're almost to a point where they can reach an agreement with the uh, developer or the, the property owner. So let's do a continuance, let's let them work it out and they'll come back to us. Um, there have been a couple cases where I think staff recommended a change, but the community, I could tell, uh, was not in favor, so I voted uh, in favor of the community, but I think that the rest of the commissioners voted a different way, but that's okay, that's why you have nine of us. So that's, that's the trick. And then if you wanted to make changes, the only thing you would do is you could start looking like at the Board of Adjustments. Because the Board of Adjustments, you have to meet after I say tomorrow is done and we have, you know, how we want development to happen, uh, you could take a cue from the Board of Adjustments because there you have to, if you want to make a change, you have a criteria that you have to meet and you have to prove how you're meeting each criteria, but that's something that can be looked at later, I guess. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, anybody else? Thanks very much for your application and your service, Mr. Garcia. Mayor, the next uh, council, the next person is uh, the tough is June Cassidy, and she also has reapplied for reappointment. June Good afternoon, June. We'll give you uh, two minutes for a statement, and then we'll go into questions from the council. Thank you. I would like to start by saying that uh, both my work and my volunteer activities reflect my great interest in the future and the well-being of the city of San Antonio. In my work, I, I went back to uh, get a graduate degree in 1980 from UTSA. It was a master's degree in urban planning and environmental management. My thesis was on how counties could deal with development, and it was published by the state and made available to all counties. I was working for San Antonio Research, preparing monthly articles on development in San Antonio, and I participated in environmental assessments in Bear County and Blanco County. After that, I worked for a planning and engineering firm and I prepare subdivision and zoning applications. Uh, and then I ended my working life as the executive director of a local nonprofit <coughs> housing organization that provided counseling, loans, and construction management services to low income families. I also oversaw the construction of new homes. In my volunteer activities, <coughs> I was a member of some city boards and commissions, the zoning commission in the 1970s. I served on committees dealing with water, neighborhoods, flood plan and drainage, sign regulation, and um, then when the Open Space Advisory Board was formed in 1990, I was the uh, first uh, board chairman for its first six years. We developed an open space plan. That's two minutes worth. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you can just ask me questions. Thank you, team. Uh, we'll go around again. Yeah, Councilwoman Sandoval. Hi, June. Thank you very much for serving and for uh, reapplying to this position. Uh, one of the things that the Planning Commission will be asked to do is to look at the climate action adaptation plan that the city is developing. 
Penelope. Just like to know how familiar you are with, um, well, A, with climate change and its impact on cities, uh, our process on developing the plan, and what role you feel cities can play in uh, addressing climate action and adaptation. Well, I think there is climate change effects, and I do think it affects the city of San Antonio. I'm currently serving on the Waste and Consumption uh, Technical Working Group, and uh, I hope I'm um, having some impact on that and the recommendations that will be made. And I think the plan is extremely critical to uh, the future of San Antonio. Thank you, Councilman Sandoval. Thank you, Ms. Katchik, for, for all your work. Um, I guess I'm just kind of curious uh, as we're as we're laying out uh, a lot of a lot of the, the the growth of our city. We see a lot of pressure in the inner city, yes. and a lot of a lot of neighbors in the inner city feel like their their voices are not necessarily being heard. How, how do you how do you help uh, those neighborhoods feel like? they have a voice in the package. Well, one of the things that I'm involved with at this time is as a member of the board of the Conservation Society, uh, we are working with the Office of Historic Preservation and also the local chapter of AIA to uh, produce four workshops for uh, inner city neighborhoods inside Loop 410. And our topic is uh, dealing with the change that occurs because of all the growth that is happening. So uh, we are hoping to develop a, uh, a way for neighborhoods to look at growth and to deal with it. Now, a lot of this is a physical change uh, that they automatically say no to. But there are, there are ways I think they would accept it if we could get to a common way of looking at things and talking about it rather than automatically saying no. So this is one of the efforts I'm involved in. Thank you, Ms. Ketchum. Thank you, Ms. Ketchum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ketchum. Thank you. Uzuna, and he also is seeking reappointment. Thank you. No, we have what, two minutes, three minutes Good, good afternoon, uh, Andrew. Yeah, so we're going to give everyone two minutes for a brief statement, and then we'll get into council questions. Are you ready? Right, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the Government Affairs Committee. Uh, I've had the privilege of serving on the Board of Adjustments uh, for over three years plus, or four years now. A uh, little background of myself, I'm a lifelong resident of San Antonio. I graduated from Thomas Jefferson High School, uh, attended UTSA, a uh, management finance degree, and then uh, Texas A&M University where I received a, a master's degree in real estate. Uh, my professional career, a 20 year plus career in commercial real estate uh, banking, where I, uh, I'm with Broadway Bank now where I manage the commercial real estate lending group. And with that group, we uh, focus on uh, investment, uh, real estate lending, um, <coughs> projects uh, all throughout uh, San Antonio. We've been really fortunate to have a really nice uh, project both in the downtown area and uh, south side, west side, all sectors of the city were uh, lending and commercial uh, projects. Um, with that, uh, my planning experience uh, uh, started my uh, volunteer work with the city as a uh, mem member of the Mayor's Tax Basin Advisory Board, uh, where then I moved to the Board of Adjustments where I served, uh, I think, uh, maybe five or six years and chaired the Board of Adjustments in that capacity. Uh, when that uh, kind of turned out, then I moved to the uh, Planning Commission where I obviously served my first term and seeking an appointment in my second term. Um, in that capacity, the fellow board members uh, appointed me uh, as a pro tem to the uh, 
Planning Commission, but also the PTAC. So I'm a member of the uh, Technical Committee, Advisory uh, Committee for the Planning Commission and attended those meetings as well. Um, so challenges in, in, that I see facing the city, uh, first of all, um, you know, we, we know that I'm, I'm familiar with the SA Tomorrow, uh, transit-oriented transit development, military development uh, concerns with that. With that. Um, challenges that the city I see face is like population growth, how are we going to handle the million plus new uh, residents that are coming into San Antonio. Uh, that needs to be balanced with the densities. No, that's, well, I'll, I'll answer your questions as you bring them up. But, um, I'll, I'll start with that question. Yes. Um, how are you balancing growth uh, with the planning commission activities? Right, exactly. So what we see with the city, a uh, million plus in the next 20 years coming in, uh, we need to we need to implement have those planning tools that that are available to the planning commission to help uh, create that both housing stock and employment stock. Some of the um, the challenges is that most of the neighborhoods where you're trying to put in these these higher densities to accommodate them, um, the neighborhoods at some points don't want to want uh, want the densities are aren't. Um, they're not knowledgeable about what that density leads to them. So what, what I think we need to do is kind of work to kind of educate the neighborhoods and, and work with the neighborhoods. They have a val very valuable place within the, within the stakeholder table on working with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the challenges that we have in creating those um, uh, you know, places for these people to live and create those densities. Some of the things that the city's kind of developed is, is a transit-oriented development, the TOD, which will create that density around the, the transit transit locations, uh, which kind of creates a density and also minimizes the traffic movement uh, within the city, and which is very important also, because if you, it all kind of goes to the quality of life, you know, if you're able to minimize those, that time you spend in your car, uh, able to have the higher densities, you live, you work, uh, you play in that same area, then it just creates for a more vibrant uh, San Antonio. So a, a lot of it is really just kind of understanding, giving the, the dignity, respect to the neighborhoods, letting them to know that, that, hey, you're a stakeholder in this, and we're not just going to push densities on you. I mean, there's, there's uh, while we're trying to create that, we, there's a stakeholder, there's a place for the neighborhoods to be heard with that. Great. Thank you, uh, yes, Senator. Councilwoman Sandoval. Hi, Mr. Osuna. Thank you for, for being here. I apologize. I missed the beginning of your... Oh, okay. that's fine. <laughs> um, I wanted to, uh, to ask you about climate action and adaptation. The city's uh, got a process going on developing a plan, and one of the functions of the Planning Commission will be to review that, that plan. So I wanted to know how familiar are you with uh, climate change, the okay. concept of it, and what role do you, oh, how familiar are you with the process of the city's? Was that that's part of the essay tomorrow? Is that within the essay tomorrow overall plan, or is this a new initiative that? Well, there was a sustainability yeah, plan. Yeah, exactly. There is that component with that essay tomorrow. Right? And it's sort of an expansion right. of, of that. And then uh, what role do you think cities can play? Yeah, in, well, in well that speaks, I just mentioned, that, like the transit-oriented development is one piece of that, where if you're able to um, create those densities where you don't have to rely on cars, fossil fuels, um, you know, burning, idling in the cars, waiting to get from you know your home, you know, from one part of the city to the other part of the city. I think that's important. I think cities do play an important part in, in trying to uh, uh, kind of bend the arc, if you will, on carbon emissions and such. And and I, you know, that's that's I think cities play an important part of that. And creating those densities is an important part of stemming that. I mean, at some point, it's not sustainable that you're going to be sitting in your car to drive out, you know, um, you know, further and further into suburbia. It's not a sustainable uh, practice, I believe. But I'm familiar with climate change, and I, I, I do. It's it's real, and the effects are real. When you see what's happening in California, you see the impacts of the flooding, the massive flooding that's occurred. That's all. That's all uh, the, uh, attributed to climate change. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Thank you, Councilman Sandoval. Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Mayor. Sure, so thank you for for reapplying. Yes. Yeah. And your service. Uh, what role do you think uh, the Planning Commission has in helping to support affordable housing in San Antonio? Right. I, mean, th I think that's a very, uh, very good question. Um, affordable housing is the backbone, I think, of the service that the city can provide to its citizens. When you look at, uh, you know, the number of people waiting for affordable housing certificates with the housing authority, I mean, it's, it's a big, it's a big problem. Um, I think the Planning Commission uh, can serve that function in trying to. Um, Make, make it an easier pathway uh, for developers to come in and provide 
housing that meets the needs of those uh, of those um, citizens that are, that are affordable, which is 80% or below the median household income. Um, that needs to be balanced out also with the neighborhoods and what the neighborhoods wants and needs are as well. Uh, there's always, you always see uh, pushback, I and mean, I've been on the planning commission and board of dozens for years and years, and there's, it's always that NIMBY, not in my backyard, um, and, and I've been um, fortunate that we've listened to the neighborhoods and sometimes we voted you know, against the neighborhoods in support of those projects. So it is a balancing act. I think the city um, has an important role in providing that um, uh, venue to, to help facilitate that affordable housing. Um, just in private practice, we were involved in some num num number of affordable housing projects, including like the Baldwin with ARP, which is one of the three people public private partnership projects um, on, there on the near east side. So it's an important factor that uh, would work, work to continue of providing that affordable housing component for the city. Councilman Vigor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we've been discussing SA tomorrow, and part of the cons real concern that some of our neighborhoods have had right. is their community plans just disappearing and going away. Mm -hmm. um, and what has been your um, position on it? Well, yeah, so um, a, a lot of the times what you see is kind of a spot zone request within the or a spot land use change within it. And um, I'm, most of the time I'm not in favor of that. I mean, that's where the neighborhoods really come out in opposition, where you have this established land plan that's been in place, and then you have somebody coming in just trying to drop in a, a specialty use, which is completely uh, against the land, the land plan. So, um, and that particular, I mean, you have to listen to all sides, but I mean, I would, and I did support uh, the neighborhoods issue uh, and the neighborhoods concerns voted against that, that particular um, the case. Uh, the neighborhoods, um, there's a plan process that's in place. Neighbors have a stake in it, and they invested a lot of time and energy, and they have a vision for what their neighborhoods want to look like, and uh, for the most part, we'll, we'll support that uh, vision the neighborhoods have, unless there's some compelling overriding reason that that uh, that, that um, would not um, would not move forward. So, thank you, Councilman Vigran. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. I appreciate your time here today. Thank you for your service as well. Thank you. Mayor and Council, the next applicant is George Peck, also seeking reappointment. George, we're giving everybody two minutes uh, for a statement, and then we'll get into council questions. Okay, thank you. Well, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Nurmberg, members of the council. I appreciate you taking the time to uh, uh, interview me for renomination of the Planning Commission. Um, the Planning Commission plays a vital role in the orderly growth and development of our community. Based on my personal and professional experience, interest in community service, understanding of the development process, and uh, participation with, uh, with industry organizations and prior six years experience on the Planning Commission, I can fulfill all the duties of the Planning Commissioner and add value to the Commission's deliberations. I'm the current chair of the Planning Commission, also the current chair of the Technical Advisory Committee. Um, I take these very seriously. Over the past two years, I have not missed a single meeting. And over the past six years, I think it's only been three or four meetings that I have uh, missed. So I take it very seriously. Um, I have served uh, on several uh, committees as a Planning Commission representative, so I'm very active outside of the normal Planning Commission meetings. Uh, my regular job, I'm a civil engineer by trade. Um, I use and implement the UDC every day in the real world environment. Um, I have 25 years experience using it, and uh, my vast knowledge of the code will come in handy and will be extremely important to the Commission and the Technical Advisory Commission uh, Committee as we move into the 2020 UDC amendments, which will start before this term expires. Additionally, uh, there's a little thing called Atlas 14 coming down the road which is the uh, review and implementation of new rainfall intensities for our area based on uh, historical weather data. Um, I'm on a com uh, committee with uh, TCI to vet these, uh, this data and come up with the new intensities. So that will come to the TAC and to the Planning Commission probably in March of next year. So my professional experience will be, will be uh, very helpful in reviewing those and coming up with something that works for our city. 
Um, additionally, that technical experience is, is a value to the other commissioners, um, the ones that may not have the technical experience. Are you telling me to stop? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you, George. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to go around the room now. Uh, we'll start with Councilwoman Sandoval. Uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Pack, sure. for your service and, and reapplying. Uh, you mentioned, I have a couple questions for you. You mentioned your vast familiarity with the UDC code, which I do think is extremely helpful, um, but you mentioned that you were also a user of it, so you use it regularly. Mm -hmm. um, how will you be able to balance what's you know convenient for you as a user and then the ultimate goal of, of the UDC? Uh, also to you know the, what's best for the for the city as right. a whole. Well, that's a great question and um, it's a question you know as a commissioner you have to ask yourself that when you're in the commission meetings you know and, and I've been able to make fair and impartial decisions on planning commission items and it's the same with the code um, as a professional engineer we're sworn to an oath we have to do what's best for the community not what's best for whoever you're working for or whoever your employer is um, you know, I look at it from, yeah, there's been several instances where it's like, okay, this would make things a whole lot easier for me as an engineer in my day-to-day -day job, but the, for the health and safety of our city, there's a different way you might have to go. It may not be the best thing, but it may, or, you know, the best thing for, for the bottom line, but it may be the best thing for the city. So you just have to use judgment is the bottom line. Um, and you have to have, me personally, you know, I'm, I'm you know, not out for self-serving, reasons I have the interest of our city in mind because if our city is is, is protected and, and healthy then we're all going to benefit from it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Follow-up question on that. Uh, you talked about Atlas 14. You talked about what's uh, best for the city, the health and safety of our city. So one thing that we're working on is a climate action and adaptation plan for the city. So I'd like to know uh, how familiar you may be with that process in the city and also what role do you think uh, cities and specifically the planning commission can play in climate action and adaptation? So I am not on the climate committee. Um, I've heard about it. I've heard some brief updates about it. Um, I'm not intimately familiar with what they're doing right now. I'm sure as it progresses, we will learn more and more. Um, I think it's very important. It's obvious that we're experiencing climate change and um, we have to be prepared for it. You know, whatever we do, um, whether it's, you know, better buildings, you know, lower emissions, which, you know, there's ways to decrease uh, vehicle trips. Um, those are the things that we have to explore. And um, the Planning Commission's role in that is to, as, as these, you know, committees are created and process what has to be done, our role is to make sure and to make sure what's coming out of those committees is what's best for the city um, through the TAC and then on to the Planning Commission. Um, you know, like I said in my presentation the planning commission's role is to is to ensure rational growth in the city and that's what uh, we have to do we have to weigh our growth versus what the climate committees are are um, presented to us thank you councilman sandoval councilman Trevino. thank you mayor thank you respect um, really appreciate your service especially as chair so i got two questions and they're related to your role as chair of this commission and one of the most important things I think uh, a chair has or role the chair has is is to maintain the, the purview or control of what the planning commission is talking about. So give us some examples of how, how you do that as chair. Well so you know let's some of our more volatile meetings you know we've had um, the, you, know, you know the role is to kind of control the flow of the meeting. Um, you know, so you have citizens to be heard and you open and close the public hearing formally. Um, and it never fails when it's an issue that is contentious. Somebody stands up and starts talking out of turn. And you just have to be forceful. You just have to say, look, please take your seat. Your time to speak is over. You know, you weren't signed up to speak when the public hearing is closed. Um, there's been a couple instances over the past two years that I've actually had to kind of say, look, uh, if you don't sit down, you're, you're going to be removed. Um, you, you, you just have to be forceful. Thank you, Mr. Peck. I think it, it is critical for the, the sake of, of, of uh, procedure and the process uh, that we maintain some level of control at these meetings, and so I appreciate your work on that. The second piece is um, tell us about uh, does our planning department brief you? Do you feel connected to our planning department? 
and what role do you see as, as the chair and the plan and communications with the planning department sort of happening? So there is communication and we do have uh, briefings in our work session which is held prior to our planning commission meetings. Um, in some cases I felt and, and I think the, the case that comes to mind first and foremost to me is the comprehensive plan. You know, I know what's happening. And, you know, I get information from a lot of different sources, so, you know, you know, I'm kind of up to date on what's happening. But a lot of the commission, if I wasn't in the industry and connected with folks at the city and, you know, whatnot, I, I wouldn't hear about it. I think that there could be a better job done of maybe more information shared between staff and the commission members um, on big ticket items like that. Most of our stuff, there doesn't need to be any more communication. But on those big items, comp plan, some of these other big things like climate plan, things like that, I think we should be brought along a little more gently versus, hey, here's the agenda. And then we have five days to look at it. Thank you, Mr. Peck, for, for your honesty. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Trevino. Councilman Saul Thank you, Mayor. Uh, George, you've got a lot of experience now on the Planning Commission, and you've heard overlapping discussions about the work and the agendas that come before you and the work and the discussion that comes before the city council. One of those big ticket items is, uh, I'm going to borrow a question from Councilman Trevino that he asked another uh, board member, which is, what is your role as a chair or a member of the commission uh, as it relates to affordable housing and what levers or tools or decisions do you have for your commission that uh, might play into the larger goals of increasing affordable housing in the city? So I probably don't have any more uh power than any other commissioner when it comes to <clears throat> excuse me to uh, pushing something forward like that you know in regards to affordable housing um, you know I hear again like I said I hear about these things because you know I'm very active within the city and, and based because of what I do for a living it's connected to that um, you know but as the chair I don't think I have any more power you know I think that that um, I do probably hear a little bit more information than some because I'll be, you know, conversations with staff or conversations with whoever is on those committees. Um, I'll hear about it, um, but I don't think I have any more information than anybody else. Is that is that what you're asking? Or? Let, me, let me dig a little deeper. If I'm imagining that there's cases that come before you all that are contentious mm -hmm. that uh, have to do with either multifamily, that have uh, options for uh, tax credit, opportunities that could see resistance from from community members. In, in your several years of, of having served, did you feel you were in a position to decide this is something that might be an overall public policy good, but may not be, and maybe in tension with what the community who is voicing and concerning uh, at the dais, at the mic, at Citizens to be heard. So there's this conflict. Have you, in any examples that you've taken up, said, you know what, this is an important decision, this is an important component to housing inventory that you cited with a project that may have gone against what communities wanted. That's the kind of example. I got you. Um, there have been instances and it's, you know, related to kind of the uh, 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 land use portion of what we do. Um, there's been instances where there's been citizens there that have wanted or not wanted something. But if you look at the facts, you look at, you know, kind of like, well, this really does benefit the area. It does kind of fit in even though they don't want it and and sometimes you do vote against what what the people are there to speak against um, and and that decision is based on what's good for what we feel as a commission is good for the community as a whole thank you George. Mm -hmm. thank you uh councilman Saldana and councilman Vigran. thank you um the uh plan and um looking at the large rezonings and the sub areas and the, and the land use plans. I'm sorry, I keep hitting the hurt it in this. Um, many of our residents, many of the neighborhood associations are concerned that their neighborhood plans will go away. Something that they've worked on for years and years, that they will go away and there will no longer be, let's say, the Jupy, uh, the Eastern Triangle neighborhood plan. So what has been your position on that since we got the commission? So I do understand what their concern is, and it makes a lot of sense. I would be thinking the same thing. It's like, why are you changing what we have? You know, what are you going to do to me? It's kind of a question. And I think that um, 
you know, as long as what is in the existing plans is is used in the creation of the revised plan for that area, and it and you know the components of it are taken into account, and the plan that is implemented has community by it, then then I think there shouldn't be any problems. That's the way it has to be done. You know, if you have a plan that the community created and then also we erase it, implement a plan that is not at all similar, that's where the community will will, will have an issue. I'm gonna I, I'm gonna stick with you on this one because uh, this is being chair, I wanted to ask you a little bit deeper. Um, but a lot of the residents come forward and they have a, a sense of attachment to that plan. So how do you all reconcile that sense of attachment that they have out of all of that with maybe the new plan that's going to be? How do you all address that issue? Well, I think you just have to make sure they understand and explain to them that, that the new plan is similar, if not the same. They're not losing any of the community feel that they have existing or that they created their original plan to create you know we're not trying to change that we're just we're we're creating new plans that are more comprehensive or larger in scale um their their individual neighborhoods are are going to remain the way they are in other words if you have a historical district we're not removing them and we no one would have any intention of doing it so you just have to assure them that their concerns their existing community plan is being taken into account thank you Thank you, Councilman Bigron. Thank you very much, George. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your service. Right. Well. Thank you. The next applicant, Mayor, is Sita Mosca. Mr. Mayor and council members for taking the time today to meet with all of us. My name is Smita Bakka, and I'd like to share with you some of the reasons why I'd like to serve on the Planning Commission and also give you a little bit of information about my background. I was born and raised in London in the UK and I attended law school there before I emigrated. Um, I then went to University of Texas in Austin and majored in government and went back to law school because I guess I'm a glutton. <laughs> um, I moved to San Antonio in 2004 and I practiced law in San Antonio ever since, primarily in the area of real estate transactions. Um, San Antonio is now my home, and I really couldn't imagine living anywhere else at this point. Um, I'm pretty involved in the local community. I both professionally in the real estate industry and also personally in the Indian community and also in my children's school communities. Um, I am inspired to serve our city more and get more involved for a variety of reasons. I recently completed Leadership San Antonio, and it's given me an even deeper appreciation for the role that each of us needs to play in our city. Um, not by accident, I was part of team civic engagement, and so um, planning commission for me is really the best fit for me to get civically engaged, just because of my background. Um, as a real estate attorney, I have subject matter knowledge, subject matter knowledge uh, in the area, and I would be the only lawyer on the planning commission. Um, I appreciate the importance of the orderly planning of our city. I understand that the bulk of the commission's work is approving plats, um, which the commission doesn't have discretion on. And in that regard, I understand the local government code requirements. Um, I've worked extensively with plats. I understand the legal nuances and development issues that need to be considered in the planning process. I also understand that plan amendments, which can be discretionary, require careful deliberation um, in order to allow the city to grow in a thoughtful way um, while protecting the character of our individual neighborhoods. So, you know, with more than a million people moving to the city in the next 20 years, it's important. Is that my timer? <laughs> Go ahead, finish. Um, it's important to think about how our decisions affect not just the city at large, but more importantly, the individual neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go around now with questions. We'll start with Councilwoman Sandoval. Thank you very much for your application. Um, I have a 
Well, actually, I'm so glad you made San Antonio your home. I think you have the whole world to choose from, but you chose San Antonio, so thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, climate action and adaptation. The city is currently developing a plan for climate action and adaptation. So I wanted to know if you're familiar with that process that the city is developing and what role you think you might, the city can play in climate action. Um, I'm glad I chose San Antonio as my home because San Antonio is such an awesome progressive city that comes up with plans like this. I'm actually not familiar with that particular plan. Um, and I guess I would probably approach it the same way I'd approach anything kind of like a lawyer. I'd probably collect all the available data, information available to me and um, make a decision on that basis. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Thank you for the application. Um, while the Planning Commission doesn't have direct purview over zoning, a lot of the cases will lead to zoning. And so my question to you is, you mentioned that you're familiar with some of the codes. How familiar are you with Chapter 35 of the UDC? Um, somewhat familiar, but if you're going to ask me a specific uh, code question, I may not be able to answer it. Okay, I mean, I think the, the key is to understand that there's, uh, as you pointed out, that, that there's connection to a much bigger picture. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, I just want to ask what, what you think about the, the role the Planning Commission has in terms of how it relates very much to a lot of zoning cases. How, how do you think that's going to impact some of the zoning cases? I'm sorry, I don't follow the question. Well, so for example, you talked about neighborhoods, right, and protection of neighborhoods. So a lot of, a lot of the decisions you make <clears throat> will have an impact in terms of what is move forward in terms of a zoning case mm -hmm. and how it would impact a neighborhood. And so I think I just want to hear your, your thoughts on the Planning Commission's role in, in being a part of that. While you don't have direct purview, you do have some, some kind of influence in, and connection to that. Well, I think it's, as I said, bifurcated. I think if it's a plat review issue, then the Planning Commission's role is limited to that plat review. Um, I don't think that they have a broader role in that. Um, but if we're talking about a larger, um, you know, discretionary matter, like a, like a plan, like a kind of master plan for a neighborhood, then I think, um, you know, they're kind of part of the equation, working kind of hand in hand with the, the zoning um, to come up with a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine Trevino. Anybody else? Um, your, familiarity with the, uh, your familiarity with the SA Tomorrow plan and the different uh, sub-area land use plans that will go eventually in front of the Planning Commission to have reviewed, what is your uh, knowledge on the SA Tomorrow plan and what is your um, take on it, I guess, from your position right now? Um, I mean, I'm somewhat familiar with the SA Tomorrow plan. Um, and I think overall it is a, a good plan for our city. Um, I know a lot of work went into it, and um, I think overall it is a good plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank, Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Mayor and Council, the next applicant is Louis Baca. Adam, as you're coming up, we're giving everyone two minutes for a statement, and then we'll go around with, with questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, Councilman, thank you very much for making time for me today. Sorry, my throat is a little bit scratchy. Um, I've done this before, so I'm not quite as nervous as last time. Um, but when I was trying to think of what to say, um, it occurred to me that Plan and by the way, as I planned out what I was going to do for the rest of my life, um, I'm supposed to be like sitting where the stackers are behind you. That's where I was supposed to be. Um, but things don't work out on the system plan. So when I came home, I still had sort of this energy and this, this cookie as it sounds, this you know, drive for public service. You know, it's a noble thing. And um, I think it's easy to forget that, especially um, lately. Um, so I'm 
very excited to be here again and to have this opportunity um, to talk to you about today. That's it for Great, thank you, Adam. Uh, we're going to go around now. We'll start with Councilwoman Sandler. Thanks for being here, Mr. Buffa. Um, one of the things that the Planning Commission will do uh, in the coming months is review the climate action and adaptation plan that's currently being developed by uh, the city of San Antonio. Can you tell me if you're familiar with that, with what's going on with that, and also what role you think the city can play in climate action and adaptation? I, I think I'm familiar with it insofar as um, the SC2020 and SC tomorrow plan. So, you know, understanding that um, that, that kind of <coughs> sustainability is um, part of the core of the three descendants in that SC tomorrow plan. So, um, I don't know how to clean up the air myself, but um, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, but but that, that's how I answer that question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Um Appreciate your application. And uh, just want to ask you, uh, what role do you feel the Planning Commission has in affordable housing and, and the, the needs that we're currently seeing in our city? Well, I think it's important to have affordable housing. It's um, you know, one of those, again, one of those things that falls inside that, that, that SA tomorrow plan, you know, in terms of sustainability again for, for, for the city. I mean, if you are constantly pushing people out of the downtown core, which, you know, we focused on, and it brings so much good to the community. I think, you know, making sure that there are places all around the city, not just in certain parts, um, that there's a little housing is probably the commission Thank you, Ms. Paul. Thank you, Mayor. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. Mayor and Council, the next applicant is Julia Carrillo. and planning my entire career. Uh, primarily focused on strategic and long-term planning for water resources and the natural resources sector, my career has taken me from a wholesale water provider in San Diego, California, to the San Antonio River Authority and eventually the Edwards Aquifer Authority. As a resident, I am personally interested in planning and development occurring around San Antonio. As we all know, the city is growing, and with an anticipated increase of over a million residents in the next 20 years, I believe that it's imperative that responsible and sustainable development be at the forefront. Uh, I feel my professional background and education in public policy and public leadership give me a unique perspective and will um, help me on this commission. Ultimately, I want to be an engaged citizen and take an active role in my community community that I've chosen to establish roots and raise my children. So that's my comments. I'll try to be brief and respective of everyone's time, but I won't take any questions. Great. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Councilwoman Sandoval. Thank you very much for your application, Ms. Cajito. Um, so I have a couple of questions for you. You mentioned that part of your work is uh, in regulatory development uh, for the Edwards Aquifer. Correct. How do you think that will interact with your role on, on the Planning Commission? Um, I, I believe that it will actually help my um, position on the uh, Planning Commission in that um, I've, I've seen 
the, regula the regulatory side, I've been on the regulatory side as well as, as a resident. I am aware of the need for, as I mentioned, responsible and sustainable development. I think there's a unique balance that has to be stricken between land use and development and um, ensuring that that's all done responsibly. So uh, as I mentioned, as, um, as being a part of the Edwards Aquifer Authority, and overseeing development and regulation, I'm sorry, regulation of development over the recharge zone specifically, um, it would allow me to uh, have um, a more concerning eye as, as plans come through. Uh, thank you. I have another question for you. Uh, the city is currently developing a climate action adaptation plan. One of the roles or one of the functions of the planning commission will be to review that uh, plan. Um, can you tell me, are you at all familiar with climate change or with the process that we're doing, and what role do you think cities can play and the commission can play in climate action? I'm, I'm not familiar with what the city is doing, I'll be honest. Um, however, I think that the, the planning commission, I mean, that what a wonderful opportunity to be at the, the forefront of that. I think that it's um, a very good idea that cities and municipalities take an active role in that, because whether, I mean, whatever side of the aisle you're on on that issue, um, there is, you know, climate change is, is occurring, and um, it's incumbent upon the city leaders to address it um, as soon as possible. Thank you, Councilman Sandoval. Councilman Tavino. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, while the Planning Commission does not have purview over zoning, uh, we will be making recommendations to the City Council on UDC amendments. How comfortable mm -hmm. are you with Chapter 35 of the UDC? I, and I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with the different chapters of the UDC. My level of familiarity with the UDC is when I was working at the San Antonio River Authority, and I worked closely with staff there as well as in TCI to implement changes to uh, stormwater um, codes and development codes and trying to implement change to the UDC, but um, specifically <laughs> Chapter 35. Um, you feel you, you get yourself familiarized pretty quickly. Yes, um, I think I could absolutely familiarize myself. In the role that I have with the Edwards, uh, I've had to get up to speed with understanding rules and regulations, not only the Edwards, but state level regulations at a very quick speed, and I'm very confident that I'd be able to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilman Trejo, it's all back. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. Cody, I, I'm, I'm really interested in the work and career path that you've taken. I'm really glad that uh, you provided yourself as an applicant for uh, the Planning Commission. Can you just tell me as you know, feedback for the future, how you found out about, about the position and, and what drove you to, to apply? Um, I was actually in the conversation of, with another city manager, one of the suburban cities here in um, San Antonio. She became a, um, sorry, as a colleague and professional mentor through my graduate program at UT. I was introduced to her and um, just speaking to her and ways to become more involved without um, actually even without being in the city or being on council as, a, as an opportunity to become an engaged citizen. Um, she recommended looking into different planning commissions, or sorry, different commissions. So in looking at the list of available commissions, the planning commission is what um, actually got my attention the most. And you know, I'm not an engineer, but um, policy and planning, I think, go hand in hand with development. So. I feel that my background really runs well to this commission. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilman Salvani. Thank you very much, okay. Ms. Craig. Thank you all for your time. Mayor Council, Tiffany Chilpati uh, was tentatively going to submit a statement, and we have checked and called her and still have not received a statement, so she will not be here today. Nicholas Creel will not be here today. And Ronnie Guest could not be here today, but he did submit a statement, and it is included in your packet. So the next applicant is Jennifer Ramos. Good afternoon. I won't be too long because I know I'm between y'all and with lunch, or maybe your afternoon. So. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to come and um, present myself for the appointment of the Planning Commission. I'm a lifelong resident of San Antonio, uh, graduated from UIW with my bachelor's and my master's in 2004 with my master's. Um, in 2004, I was elected to Alamo College's Board of Trustees. 
And I served there until 2008 when I got the appointment to City Council. And so I served on City Council from 2008 to 2012. During my tenure, we did some really great things. I have to say City Manager, correct? <laughs> that was the decade of downtown. That was the um, reinvestment of the east side zone, which led to the um, submission, <clears throat> excuse me, the submission to HUD for the approval of the Promise Zone. So it was a really great time to see the east side kind of redevelop. I'm sorry, I'm kind of, I got me nervous. <laughs> um, also on top of that, during my tenure, we went through some tough times too. We had the nuclear project as well through CPS, and so that was a difficult time. So we've seen some good and some bad, and that happens in every city council. And every every year, you have a lot of different projects that come come to fruition, and you make the best decisions that you have with the, with the amount of material and the amount of information you have at hand. So. Um, also, I was able to be a part of some great things in District 3, the opening of the Texas A&M, the opening of the Toyota plant. Um, I know me and Councilman Saldana went, went to battle on who's going to keep Texas A&M <laughs> in our district because we went through re redistricting while I was there. Thank you so much. Um, at the same time, uh, I was also part of the submission for the city when we started the application process for, these, uh, for the World Heritage of the Missions. So, seen a lot of great things happen for the city. More recently, I've worked with Merced Housing Texas, um, where it's an affordable housing developer. Okay, is that it? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Councilman Sandoval. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, there is certainly a lot on your application, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to meet to meet with you in advance and, and run through your, your outstanding qualifications. Um, I do have a couple questions for you. Um, one of them has to do with uh, your work for HAP and, and Associates and uh, your business development. Uh, how do you think that might affect your work as a planning commissioner? I have to tell you, um, great thing about HAP, we are 750 employees uh, statewide. Um, our main corporate office is in Richardson and in our local office we do really concentrated disciplines. We really do public works, um, highway pro projects with TxDOT. We do a lot of public work and civil and municipal work. Um, land development, I have to tell you, we have probably a 1% kind of uh, clientele for land developers. Um, so I don't see a huge conflict at all. I've already also spoken with uh, the city attorney's office as well to, to make sure that there was no conflict, especially, you know, I, I love to work. So I want to make sure that there was no boundaries to be passed or any perceived conflicts. But I don't see that there would be an issue. If, if anything, it's an advantage because I'm able to understand also that planning process, surveying uh, how actually properties and, pro and parcels are developed and how an engineering um, firm can do their due diligence and make sure that there's proper runoff or there's proper uh, retention on the property as these developments are coming online how to build you know, apartment communities where it's not so impactful to neighborhoods as far as parking and these additional um, issues that, that the citizens face when big developments come into their neighborhoods and they're an existing neighborhood and you have what we so call gentrification at times. So I think uh, my background now will help me in those kind of uh, tough decisions and tough discussions and help bring a different uh, balanced view because I also see the aspect of the neighborhood as well. So it's not just the engineering side that I represent, but my passion is for the city of San Antonio to grow. I love my city and I want to continue to be a part of that planning process. Thank you, Ms. Ramos. Um, my, my other question, you talked about runoff and, uh, and drainage. So one thing with the city's developing right now is a climate action and adaptation plan. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that process. Um, you are, I'd like to know. And then also what role you think the city climate action and adaptation? I'm not very familiar with the process or what point you're at the, at the process. I do um, I do have some experience when we're bringing in new concepts and um, how important it is to really bring every stakeholder to the table. Um, we need to get everybody involved from neighborhoods to um, elected officials to uh, the business community and make sure there's an open dialogue and open transparent process if not it always gets delayed you always have 30 questions right at e session or a session and you're trying to solve these problems so i would just um, want to be a part of the conversation 
making sure that everybody's voice is recognized, um, everyone from District 5 to District 10, from District 3 to District 9. Um, there needs to be a balanced uh, voice, and you're not going to satisfy everybody. I mean, there's going to be issues that you're not able to satisfy everybody, but you have to try your hardest and make sure that you have that communication back and forth to make sure that everybody understands we have we have to deal with climate change and we have to deal with the betterment of our community and make sure that we have a lasting impact for our next generation and generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Sandoval, Councilman Trevino. Samos, uh, thank you for applying. Um, I want to just ask you, what role do you see the Planning Commission playing in addressing the four plans in San Antonio? Um, well, that's a, I think everybody that's involved and city council, whether in the city, should be involved in those conversations. So planning commission definitely has a huge stake in it. I also, my background, I think it's going to it, but uh, work for Merced Housing Texas, which is um, a nonprofit affordable housing developer for here, San Antonio and the state of Texas. And so I saw um, the need for affordable housing when I was on council, but I don't think there was such a concentrated push at the time. And now you see the impact because you see that we are at we we are in need, desperate need of affordable housing. And while working there at um, Merced Housing Texas, whether it was affordable housing in, in the in the aspect of multifamily, or whether it was people keep, keeping people in their current homes and making sure that they had the tools to reinvest in their home, so they're not left out in cold and not able to uh, keep a head, I mean keep a roof over their head. I saw it firsthand. So the planning commission definitely has a huge role in in, in this conversation as well. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. I appreciate you mentioning roofs. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> you Councilman Trevino. Uh, Councilman Salvatti. Thank you, Mayor. Just to uh, thank the Councilwoman for rolling us to step up and, and serve again. And uh, I'm grateful to see her. Thank you. Councilwoman Thank you very much for applying. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramos. Here, Council, the last applicant that's here is Charisse Rowe of Reedy. She is young and Charisse, you're up. Charisse, we're giving everyone two minutes and then we'll go into Council questions. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here today. I'm Charisse Rowe of Reedy. I'm not a native of San Antonio. I came here in 2001, living on the northwest side for a very short time, and then moved um, into the Lavaca neighborhood in 2002, where I've been a renter at first and now a, a homeowner for a number of years. Um, so I've been around for a while to see some of the changes and how we uh, proceed with development um, in the urban core as well as throughout the city. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a pretty active member of my community. Um, I've worked a lot with our neighborhood and in various communities um, on some of the housing and land use issues. And I'm currently the Lavaca Neighborhood President. I've been there for a year now and was on the board before that. And through that role, have worked with the uh, task force on some of the zoning change discussions, some of them that you heard earlier today. Um, and um, have spent a great deal of time with the SA Tomorrow planners on discussions, mostly on how it impacts neighborhoods like mine and the urban core. Uh, for the past year, I was um, invited to participate in the Mayor's Housing Task Force, um, representing the Equitable and Resilient Neighborhoods Technical Work Group, um, which was a valuable experience. And one of the things I appreciated was that there were uh, such a diverse array of people mm -hmm. that were involved in those discussions. Um, my day job is as a public health professional. Um, I have worked for the city and the state before. Currently, I work for a nonprofit that does public health education and legislative advocacy. And typically, you don't think of a public health professional as somebody that would be interested in planning. I think from my uh, experience of representing my neighborhood and my community, that's pretty obvious. But there actually is a big move nationwide to integrate uh, public health with urban planners. And it's been a long process, and a lot of people don't see that, how obvious that is. But when you start to think about it, it does become more obvious. Um, because public health people think about every decision we make, how does it impact the health of our individuals and health of our community. Um, that could be how roads are developed, how they're used, etc. So it's up there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Councilwoman Sandoval. 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rora Alegrini, for, for applying. My first question was going to be how your work might impact your role on the Planning Commission, but I think you've, uh, you've addressed that. Uh, sort of, yeah. So I'll let you just continue. quickly explain. So my, my regular job is actually in uh, immunizations education. So my, my, my paid job <laughs> is not very related, but because I'm a public health professional, I spend a lot of time in public health meetings and discussions and the annual meeting of a public health association, et cetera, uh, which really does influence my thinking on public health and urban planning. Thank you. And then uh, my next question has to do with uh, climate change. So the city's currently developing a climate action and adaptation plan. Let me know if you're familiar with that process and what role you think cities can play in climate action. I'm somewhat familiar with the process, mostly by following in and talking to some of the folks that are involved and trying to get them to come to speak for us. Um, uh, it is an absolutely critical issue, um, and San Antonio is at the forefront of it. We really are. We can do so much here, um, and even though whatever decisions are made nationwide as a city, we can address some of the issues that do in fact um, climate, affect climate, uh, both locally and more broadly across the state. So that could be how, how we develop clean roads, how we develop transportation, um, that can impact um, the overall climate, which when we think about climate change, it's a broad thing. And most of us like to see success um, quickly. And in public health, we know that success doesn't happen really quickly. It's a very long process. So um, of having, making decisions that will positively impact the issue of climate change may not be that obvious and something we can celebrate right away, but uh, we know will be better for the community overall. Thank you, Mary. Um, yeah. uh, tell us what the, what you what role do you think the Planning Commission will play in addressing affordable housing in San Antonio? Well, in determining how land is used in uh, different parts of the city, and we we talk a lot. I, I talk a lot about the urban core because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, but affordable housing needs to happen across the entire city. Um, and so how we impact development, um, what kind of development, are we um, making sure that jobs are in the place um, where the affordable housing is located? Um, we talked about it in terms of areas of opportunity. And if we're going to make a decision to allow um, use in a certain way, does it include all aspects? And so sometimes we think about the, the positives, we don't think about the negatives. And I want us as a planning commission to think about what are the negative impacts and how can we address those before? So I'm gonna go back to public health. In public health, we talk about prevention. And I think that applies in planning as well. Can we prevent the negative impacts from happening if we take a step back and think about that? So that does affect affordable housing. I spent a long time talking about affordable housing last year at the, the Housing Task Force. Um, that, and that's going to be a long conversation to get into, but I think that we can make an impact by how we determine um, where it's going to go, what um, accessibility there is. Is You can put in affordable housing, and we talk about affordable housing that means a lot of things. Um, most people think of it as low income. It's not just low income. It's the 80 to 100% AMI as well, and that's what we're lacking in this city. Are we going to be able to put that there as well as um, accessible roads that go there, uh, bus transportation, other other means of, of transport, so that we're not um, adding to the climate change problems by requiring people to use their vehicles more often, or we providing public transport, et cetera, to that affordable housing. There's also the affordable housing for the lower income, which is a whole different topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm Councilman Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. Thank you for your application. I'm, I'm thrilled to get to read through your academic experience and your work experience. Uh, really well qualified candidate. I guess I want to ask about um, you know, what drove you to find the application and, and motivation to, to apply. I see you've got you know, president of the Milwaukee Neighborhood Association and a few other things with the Mayor's Housing Task Force that would lead me to believe that you, know, you have a passion for wanting to get involved. Uh, why, why the planning commission? Um, so, as you if you saw my resume, you see that I've done a lot of different things in my life, and so it all kind of comes full circle. Um, I, I participated in the Latina Leadership Institute this past spring, which was an amazing experience, and a lot of that was geared towards getting us ready to participate in boards and commissions. Um, I had already decided I wanted to do that, and honestly, it was a matter of um, 
looking through the different commissions, um, seeing which one really worked for me. And I think um, having been um, involved with my neighborhood association for a number of years, and then more recently as president, um, ha I've been involved in a lot of discussions about planning, um, both formally as well as we have another informal group that is mostly urban core residents um, who've been involved in uh, more formal capacities and informal capacities. We have sort of a monthly lunch to discuss housing and land use. Um, that's given me a lot of ideas um, about where we can go uh, with it. So those were probably the, the motivating factors. I felt like I, I wanted to do something and this would be a good role uh, for me to step into given my experience with my neighborhood, but I'm gonna come back to public health again. <laughs> that is what drives me. And a public health professional thinks about the whole community. We're different from physicians who spoke, who are, their focus is on an individual. So uh, as a public health professional, we're looking at how does our decision affect everybody in the community, not just getting that one person well. Um, and I think that relates a lot to what we can do in planning is how do the decisions we make, how are they gonna impact the broader community? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much, Therese, Thank you. Uh, for your application. 1.30 p.m. on this 13th day of November 2018, pursuant to the authority granted by Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, BTCS, the Texas Open Meetings Act, the Governance Council Committee will now recess into executive session to discuss and deliberate the appointment of planning commission members pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.074 personnel matters. Unfortunately, not everyone we want to be on the commission is going to get selected because they have a limited number of spots. But I would tell you uh, that we want to find places for all of you to um, serve our community because uh, it's a very impressive group of people, and, and we want to thank you for your uh, stepping forward and applying uh, to serve our community. So at this time, I'll entertain a motion uh, for appointments to the planning commission. Sure. Mayor, I'd like to make the motion. Uh, for the term expiring 2019 in October, uh, Christopher Garcia, and the following would expire October of 2020. That would read as follows. June Kachik, George Peck, Julia Carrillo, Jennifer Ramos, and Cherise Roar Allegrain. Okay, there's a motion and a second for the slate of planning commission members. Uh, effective immediately. Any comments? My colleagues? Okay, hearing none. And then uh, I just uh, want to add that this will go on the full council agenda for November 29th. November 29th, end of the month. Okay. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Uh, hearing no further comments or questions, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. That is the remainder of our uh, governance committee agenda. Uh, we are now adjourned. Thank you, everyone.